Tara Kiesling here with Together We Will. We're in an interview with Mike Morosky, okay. Cincinnati School Board candidate, um, and Don is our interpreter from Cincinnati State. Thank you, Don, for being here. Okay. Um, this is, again, Together We Will. If you enjoy this interview or have seen other interviews like this, this will be pretty similar to what we normally do. Um, we will continue interviews like this for other Cincinnati School Board candidates as well as candidates for governor. So give us a big like on Facebook if you'd like to keep up on what we're doing. Um, anybody who is watching this video is allowed to ask a question. Uh, just click on the video and put your question in the comment section. Um, we do ask that no questions come from other candidates for school board. Um, we try to keep this fair. Um, that's kind of the general rule for everybody. No other candidates can ask a question. But anybody else in the audience is free to. Um, and if, if you know anybody that would be interested in a video like this, feel free to tag them potentially in the comments or tell them about our page, ask them to give us a like so they can keep, up, keep in the loop on what we're doing. Um, and we also have a Twitter. So our Twitter handle is at T-W-W-S-W-O-H. If you'd like to follow us there. Are we good to go? We are waiting for everybody to connect with us. We are connecting with multiple groups today. If you have any questions for Biggie, too. Yes, we have a dog here. You perhaps will hear his licking throughout this video. <laughs> going pretty ferociously on his paw right now. He's actually not supposed to be doing that. He's got an infectable. Stop it. Oh, no. Stop it. Stop it. OK. <laughs> if you'd like to know more about Mike, you can feel free to visit his website at MikeMoroski.com. His last name is spelled M-O-R-O-S-K-I. Um, you could also follow him on Twitter, on Twitter at Mike underscore Moroski. And some highlights about Mike. Um, he has his undergrad and graduate degrees in English from Xavier. Um, he got his teaching, teaching license at the same time. Um, he taught English at Moeller for 10 years. He was the house dean for six of those years. After Moeller, he was the dean of student students at Purcell Marion, where he lost his job for supporting the LGBTQ community. Um, he is an affordable housing advocate and project leader. He has rehabbed building, several buildings um, for about 11 years in Over the Rhine. Um, nine years ago, Mike co-founded Choices Cafe with Mike Rogers, a formerly homeless man. Um, Choices Cafe is no longer in business, but some of its programs still exist, um, such as the HELP program, um, which builds job skills and find, finds careers for citizens returning from prison. Mike graduated from the University of Notre Dame in May 2013 with a master's in nonprofit business administration. Um, his past positions include um, initial board chair at Wordplay in Micah's house. He's a trustee at the Drop-In Center Homeless Shelter. I mean, recently he has become the director of engagement and development at Community Matters in Lower Price Hill current positions, and he has a long list, so I may not read all of these current positions. Yeah, it's okay. You don't have to. Very impressive list of positions and awards, I will say, so I'm going to highlight a few of them. Um, he's the executive director of Upspring, the only local nonprofit exclusively serving the educational needs of children experiencing homelessness. He's a trustee at the Southwestern Ohio Region Workforce Investment Board, a member of the City of Cincinnati, Cincinnati City of Cincinnati's Human Sources Human Services Ad Advisory Committee. Each yeah. sec. It's a lot. Yes. It's a lot. Mouthful there. Yeah. Appointee at the Mayor's Hand, Hand Up Initiative Steering Committee, um, Trustee Board of Invest in Neighborhoods, Trustee of Preschool Promise Community Engagement Committee. Um, the list will keep going. going. So I'm going to yeah. move on to his awards. Um, and again, just a few of these yeah, awards just we're some, highlighting. Yeah. He has several. Just a few. Um, he has the Magis Award from Xavier University's highest honor for, which is Xavier University's highest honor for a young graduate for service to the city of Cincinnati. Um, Moeller High School's Founders Day Award for his leadership with his students. He's the Business Courier's 40 Under 40 class of 2011. Um, and the Human Rights Campaign's Alley, he also has the Human Rights Campaign's Alley Award for his public defense of marriage equality, which cost him his job at Purcell Marion. So, Mike, is there anything I missed that you would like to tell the people? No, just that I'm really, really excited to be here. <laughs> I appreciate um, you all hosting these events. I think it's really, really important, especially uh, in 2017, as more and more folks seem to be engaging in the process. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah. I appreciate it. 
Um, so you are, I believe, our second Cincinnati School Board candidate. So some of these questions will be more general. Sure. Um, just in case someone hasn't tuned into the first one, um, they might be more about location and sure. just general answers to questions about this position and what it means. Sure. Um, and also why you want it. Absolutely. So I'll get into the first question, which is why do you want to be on the Board of Election or Education? So every professional decision that I've made in the past 16 years, um, as you outlined very eloquently, thank you, um, has had children at the center of the decision-making process. Furthermore, my life's trajectory that you heard some about from Tara um, is literally the direct result of responding to young people's hopes and dreams and aspirations. I started my life as an English teacher. That's what I thought I would probably do. And then some young teenagers said, well, why don't we go to Over the Rhine? And why don't we work on affordable housing? And we did that. And that led to, why don't we buy some buildings and lead um, full rehabilitation projects to the tune of a quarter million dollars? I didn't necessarily know what I was doing. But I said, sure, we should probably do that. And then I had a bunch of homeless friends. And they said, why don't we open up coffee shops? And I said, well, that sounds like a good idea, too. And so little by little, I just kept responding to young people's dreams and hopes, saying, why don't we do this? And we did it. And it literally just kind of designed where I was led. So um, in addition to that, uh, I was raised in a family that paid a lot of attention to politics. My grandfather was a union railroad man in northern Ohio, ran for Democratic office, never won. I'm going to break that streak. Uh, my dad worked with the Teamsters for his whole career negotiating labor contracts. And so I was always kind of raised to pay attention. So I always knew that public service was important. And when I sat down to think about what would make the most sense for me publicly regarding a public service position on the Public Board of Education um, in Cincinnati. I feel I have the skills and experience uh, to enable me to do a good job there, and I also believe that it's the single most important public service position in the city of Cincinnati. Um, and I'd like to be afforded the opportunity to make a difference there. And not to put you on the spot, but it's not just the city of Cincinnati that can vote for a school board candidate. Right? Correct. There are a couple other places. Right. So the, the, the voting area for the public school board, and I'm glad you pointed that out, is the city of Cincinnati plus. So it's the city of Cincinnati, Golf Manor, Amberley Village, Silverton, a few streets in Green Township. I've been told it's like a street in Anderson Township, and some people tell me that's not true. Um, and then all of Cheviot. So if you live in any of those areas, even if you don't live in Cincinnati, you'll be voting for a school board right. next election in November. That's right. In case you didn't know, there's an election in November. That's the most important. <laughs> yeah. um, what are the top challenges facing the district, and what role will you take when it comes to resolving those issues? Okay, so for me, when I think about the top challenges in the district, uh, three come to mind immediately. Uh, one is segregation. Um, uh, our, our schools are still segregated, uh, it, and it doesn't take a long time to realize that if you pick five, pick three random schools and go into them. Um, and that's because the city of Cincinnati is the sixth most segregated city in the United States of America. Um, so there's not a lot necessarily you can do as a public school board because the city itself is so segregated, but there certainly are efforts afoot already. Um, some that I think are very well intentioned, some I think that are going to have a lot of unintended consequences that we're going to have to deal with going forward. Um, for example, um, arbitrarily making a neighborhood school this type of magnet and this neighborhood school this type of magnet um, without necessarily garnering the input from the community. So I think we really need to look at the segregation. Um, in the United States of America today, in public school districts, people use the term reintegration, but if we call it what it is for real, it's desegregation. Um, that kind of leads into my second point, which is a, a culture of toxic communication and uh, a district that has almost overtly discouraged community involvement. Um, and that toxic uh, communicative strategy that comes from the governance of this public school board down, um, it actually discourages people getting engaged. And so you have situations where people um, are moving into neighborhoods um, where they don't look like everybody else that's lived there for decades. Um, that's not up to me to be the judgment police on, but that is happening all over the city. And these same families are interested in public school education. Generation X and millennials are much more interested in public school education, I think, than private. Um, it's a broad brush, I realize that, but it seems to be trending back that way, which is great. But they're not even considering sending their kids to the neighborhood school because it doesn't look like them. And I honestly believe that a lot of that could be alleviated by a better communication strategy. Um, 
i.e. marketing. Hey, guess what goes on at Rosenberg? They got this rooftop garden. People don't know what goes on in these schools um, because again, they're discouraged from engaging. Lastly, from the state level, um, and I'll get into this I think probably later on, so I'll just say something about it now. The third biggest pressing issue is voucher and for-profit charter proliferation um, that is designed to destroy public schools, period. Um, and it needs to be fought. Okay, um, so this is kind of a question that goes along the same lines and sure. we'll touch at this. What are your top priorities and why are those your top priorities? I think you may have answered that sure. in the last question. Yeah, I think, you know, so the two big ones, um, because uh, I'm fond of saying on the campaign trail, and those of you who have heard me speak, uh, I apologize, some of this will be old news to you. For those of you who haven't, this will be brand new. Um, I, uh, I won't promise anything that I can't do. And that might sound like the world's most obvious statement, but as I think anybody who's watching this that pays attention to the political process knows that it's not necessarily that obvious. So, for example, I can't promise that I'm going to hire all the best principals in the world because the school board doesn't hire principals. Uh, but two things that I can do that I think can uh, take a bite out of at least some of the issues we just talked about um, is implement a robust, real communication strategy that has designed, excuse me, um, design metrics and goals that you can reach. So we talk about communication strategies in esoteric terms, I think, when we refer to public governing entities engaging with the public, um, but we don't really ever provide like goals. So we're gonna have a communication strategy. What does that mean? Are you gonna go to every LSDMC meeting, local school decision-making committee that governs each individual school? Um, are we going to ensure that X amount of families have engaged with the district by this date? And we can easily implement that in the first four years if I'm elected. The second thing is a district-wide discipline policy that's uh, universally enforced, that's universally enforced um, and equally enforced. Sorry, my dog, my dog is, Biggie, do you not like these answers? <laughs> Biggie, Biggie wants more treats in the schools. Why can't the dogs go in the schools, Dan? Um, anyway, sorry. Um, a discipline policy that's evenly and equitably and consistently enforced. I did discipline when I was an assistant principal, and I know the value of having a real discipline policy that is designed to help change a young person's behavior so that they can make decisions that benefit him or her and not just to punish. So those would be the two, discipline policy and communication strategy. Thank you. Um, what was the biggest change or improvement you initiated in a previous position, and what specific difficulties did you face? There's another part to that question, so I'll let you answer that. Sure. First. Okay. Um, there are a couple. When I think about, you know, if I were to be asked what I'm proudest of regarding organizational institutional change, uh, I'd say it's my present position, honestly. Um, uh, as executive director of Upspring. So in the past two years and a couple months since I've gotten this job, we have uh, tripled the budget, we've doubled the staff, and we've increased our capacity to serve more kids. Um, and that wasn't necessarily easy. The entire staff is different than when I got there. Um, and whenever you inherit something that's been around for a while, uh, people have a lot of attachment to those things. And that's important to recognize. And I talk a lot about transition management. And when I was at Notre Dame, uh, getting the MBA in nonprofit and educational finance, uh, I focused a lot of my research on transitional change. And what people need to understand who are governing, and the public school board is a governing board, they need to understand that change and transition are different. Um, so whether it's uh, an upspring, tripling the budget, doubling the staff size to serve more kids, whether it was helping broker the move of the drop-in center, which was very difficult, um, whether it was changing the discipline policy at Purcell Marion. Um, leaders need to understand that change is relatively simple. It's situational, things change. But transition is psychological and people have feelings and they're attached to things. And that's important to recognize. And I think coming from that position, that transition and change are different and that people have every right to feel sadness if something changes, a name changes, something we might say, why well, is that a big deal? It is a big deal, um, whether we think it is or not. And coming from that place, I think, is important when you're managing change or implementing something new. And at Upspring, we changed the name. We cut two longstanding programs. We added programs that had never existed. And it was difficult, but the way I went about it was before anything happened is met with every primary stakeholder from the past to make sure that they knew what was happening. Not everyone was happy, but they knew it was going to happen. 
Um, so along the lines, <coughs> what steps did you take to resolve those difficulties? It sounds like communication was a huge part of that. Right. Um, were there any other? Jayla, you want to take him out and get his leash? Just take, run him around the hallway. Sorry. Um, sorry, Biggie's very excited about this. Um, yeah. I came from a place of listening, and what I found in my career is that um, Jayla is the best campaign manager ever, by the way. If you ever decide you want to be a campaign manager, just know it's not all running around knocking on doors. It's also taking the dog out sometimes when your candidate is talking on Facebook Live. <laughs> so, pro tip. Anyhow, thank you, Jayla. Um, Jayla, incidentally, is a former student of mine, and now she's my boss, which is cool. Um, so, listening. And I have found in my career that adults are willing to be told no, but not if they're not listened to. And you look at like the public school district, public school district makes a lot of decisions in a bubble. And I, I firmly believe that a lot of the groups who are upset with the Cincinnati Public School District wouldn't be as upset if somebody had listened to them. So I try to build coalitions, right? Coalitions of support is step one. You're always going to get a third of people that are with you. You're going to get a second third of people that are going to take some time, and then a third of people that aren't going to want to do anything. Um, that middle group is important because the third early adopters, people like me, who are like, oh, yeah, it sounds like a really innovative idea. Let's do it. You got the second group of people is the people that I like to focus on the most and to bring them on. And, and, and they might have distrust. They might not understand it, but they're leaning to it. Oh, I want to learn more about it. The group that most people write off, which is a very dangerous and disrespectful, in my opinion, unethical thing to do, the group that's like, I don't want, this is the way we've always done it. You always hear people talk bad about those folks. Those aren't bad folks. Oftentimes the people that this is the way we've always done it are the people that started whatever it is you're trying to change. And you can't write them off. But that middle group, getting that middle group and building those coalitions, bringing that middle group along is the only way you can get that other group along. Typically what I see when people go through change or transition is they write off the third group, the last group. They give piecemeal sound bites to the middle group and then hang out with the easy group. I like to ha hang out in the middle space and help bring along the others. And people still won't always be happy, but they'll feel respected. And that's the important thing, I think. What do you want voters to know about the Cincinnati Public Schools um, Board of Education or about Cincinnati Public Schools in general? Sure. Um, first, I, I would like people to know that Cincinnati Public Schools are, are great schools. It's a great district. And by and large, Ernst & Young has told us that the district spends money wisely. And the reason I bring that up is there are a lot of candidates that are running around attacking how CPS spends money. Now, I'm not saying they're spending money on all the right things but they are spending their money wisely and the reason i think it's a dangerous narrative for some candidates to go out there and paint this picture the district doesn't know how to spend money in november the district needs to pass an emergency levy renewal because like it or not we fund the district based on emergency levy renewals and we're one emergency level levy renewal away failure away from fiscal emergency and i think it's dangerous for some folks for any folk rather to run around and demonize how the district spends their money because what can you do then if some, are you gonna ask the same people to vote for the emergency labor? You know what, this side of your mouth, you say they don't know how to spend their money. They do know how to spend their money. But the way we're funded is unconstitutional and unethical. So I think that's important. Um, now, is the district putting all their money where I think it should go? No, that's a different issue. That's not the same issue as spending unwisely, right? They're spending their money wisely with what they budgeted for, but we'll probably get to that later, so I'll shelve it. So I'd like people to know that. I would also like people to know, and this is very important, <clears throat> that the public school board is a governing board. I've said this a couple times already. I realize that. But the difference between governance and management is very important. And you hear some folks, the things that they're saying they would like to do are things the superintendent does. Okay? The public board of education hires two people, the treasurer and the superintendent. That's it. So if anyone's talking about, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to hire principals, it's not true. They can't do that. A governing board sets the strategic direction and then holds the superintendent to account and the treasurer to account to make sure that that's happening. Um, governance and management are different things. So in terms of that the regu a regular person could un understand, I guess. Sure. It's, it's like a board of trustees for a nonprofit or a board of trustees for <coughs> a large company. Mm -hmm. They can make decisions, right? Mm -hmm. and they can hire maybe the top person, mm -hmm. but day to day, they don't handle day to day. They don't handle day to day, and <clears throat> sometimes you, you, you'll find um, folks 
on these boards that want to get down into the weeds and get down into the, the, the school level where the rubber meets the road and intervene. And that's not, it's not healthy. Uh, I do believe that uh, an understanding of chain of command is important, particularly in a governing uh, entity that oversees so much public money. I think it's important to know what the roles are and only knowing what the roles are can you actually hold people to account and can you actually impact change. So on the governing level, uh, you have the ability to say, okay, we are going to have this strategic um, communication plan and our superintendent, Laura Mitchell, is going to hold whoever the new communications director is because it's not Janet Walsh anymore. She stepped down. You will hold this person to account because this has to happen. Here's the plan. Now enact it. Um, it's not to go into schools and say, we don't like how you're doing this. That's the principal's job, and the superintendent needs to work with those folks. So I just think the difference is important, um, and I, I think it's important to know that when folks say they're going to do X, Y, or Z, that they actually have the ability to do X, Y, or Z. I think that's important, too. Yeah. Um, especially if people don't really know what the role is supposed to be. <clears throat> Um, since <coughs> the budget has come up a couple of times, I'll sure. skip ahead to some sure. budget questions and maybe go back to general questions okay. um, later. What will you do to ensure successful collaboration on budget creation and adherence? And is there anything you'd like to change about the current budget al allocations? Sure. So I'll do the first one first. Okay. Um, and uh, ensure successful collaboration. So you have the organized labor groups at the table. Um, you don't have the school LSDMCs, the local school decision-making committees at the table. And for those of you who don't know who, what that is, if you think city council and neighborhood community councils, you think public school board and LSDMC. It's kind of reductive, but it's good enough, I think, um, for our uh, time here. The difference, though, is that city council listens to neighborhood community councils. The public school board doesn't really listen to the LSDMCs. They're there. Um, they don't get visited often by the public school board members. I foresee a day where the seven members on the Board of Education maybe adopt or divvy up the LSDMCs in the district. So I would have real quick math, seven or eight, um, that I would go visit a couple times a year. Um, inviting in the LSDMCs. LSDMCs are empowered to do one very significant thing, and that's to have a role um, in the hiring of a principal in a school. So outside hiring the principal, they don't have a lot of fiscal, financial um, uh, oversight or, or ability. And I would like to see a day through my role with Invest in Neighborhoods in the city of Cincinnati working with the 50 neighborhood councils, and I see the power in those voices. Um, I've helped plan the neighborhood summit for years. We have six, 700 community leaders come. I, I, I envision a day where there's a, a school summit like the Neighborhood Summit, where everybody comes and learns in their sessions and they know each other. And wouldn't it be neat if the LSDMC at Rockdale um, hung out with the LSDMC at High Park School? How cool would that be? Because the community councils are doing it and it helps and it matters. So I would invite more people into the process through that LSDMC. Again, you can't just invite everybody in. But city council does it. They go out in the neighborhoods when they have their budgeting. They go to three different neighborhood centers and they listen to what the community wants. I don't see why we can't do that. Thank you. Um, if you're just joining us or you've been on the line watching this video, um, remember that you can ask Mike any question that you'd like. He's running for Cincinnati School Board. Just click on the video and add your question in the comment section. Feel free to even tag friends that you know would be interested in something like this. Um, so our next question for Mike is, um, oh, is there anything you'd like to change about current budget allocation? Oh, yeah. Yes, I would like to have seen more teachers get hired. Uh, if you talk to teachers in the classrooms, um, I'm not speaking for all the teachers, I'm talking to some friends of mine that I've already spoken with. Um, everybody got a 2% raise, which is awesome, right? Um, a lot of that came from the voters giving uh, CPS the gift of issue 44, so thank you for that. Um, and the 2% raise is nice. It's largely a cost of living increase though and uh, the schools need more teachers again people want to send their kids to Cincinnati public schools they do and there's overcrowded schools um, gamble busting at the seams high park schools busting at the seams um, Walnut Hills is a over the seams Fairview over the scene and either we need more buildings or more teachers or something and um, 
I would have liked to have seen more teachers get hired. I would have also liked to have seen um, AFSME. Um, so the CFT is the teachers union, right? And AFSME um, uh, works with cafeteria workers, custodial staff, etc. There are, last I saw, unless this changed with the budget allocations, and it may have, um, but uh, 600 AFSME employees making under $15 an hour. So that's a problem um, to me. Uh, not every employee in the district is getting a fair shake. Some are, and that's great. That's awesome, actually. Um, but we, I think we have the ability to give everybody a fair shake. So this goes back to the so district spending wisely. Yes, renew the levy um, every year, please. Um, we need it. Uh, is there way, are there ways um, to spend the money differently, more wisely, I think, perhaps? And, and for my money, it would be um, more adults to take care of kids. I see that in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, my organization used to hire six teachers a summer to work with kids experiencing homelessness. We now hire 16. And we have two per classroom and the class sizes are smaller and we broke it out and our increases in summer um, retention have skyrocketed because of it. So more qualified adults in the buildings. Um, with such a large spectrum of learning abilities from gifted and talented students to um, students with individualized education programs, um, what will we do to ensure all children in the district get the services they need? So interestingly, this is a fun fact. Um, it's a sad fact. Um, most of the kids with IEPs get services they need now, and as a result, the district gets punished for it. So when they come up with these state grades, and we hear about it all the time, it's a failing school district. Uh, everything is terrible. Uh, we don't have enough time in this one hour segment to go into all the problems with the way the state grades the schools. But one of the things that they actually get nicked for is if they accommodate all the students who need test accommodations. So if you have a school with a high percentage uh, of young people who need test accommodations, etc., you get an allotment. So let's say it's 10. These numbers are not scientific, by the way. But let's say it's 10. Here's your 10 uh, neighborhood school Y. And neighborhood school Y has 34 kids, which is probably more in real. And so neighborhood school Y is like, well, the right thing to do is to accommodate all of them. So they do. And they get punished for it. And when you get punished for it, your grade goes down, the bad press, the money chain, et cetera, and it's, it's a mess. So right now, the district does, I think, um, the best job they can meeting all of the needs of those students. Uh, the ones, the, the schools that aren't, and I don't know, I don't have all the lists of every single kid, obviously, in the district, nor may I ever, um, but who knows? Maybe I will someday. Um, but if schools aren't doing it, Sadly, I mean, it's because they get graded on it and they, they get punished for doing the right thing. And that's the system that we have set up currently in the state of Ohio, is you get punished for doing the right thing. So we have a question from the audience here. Okay. Um, CPS is losing countless dollars due to corporate welfare. Um, what are ways you could fight this to get more tax dollars into our schools? So it's a great question. Um, it's a great question, and it's true. And so the Senate bill that was going to uh, increase that and make it even worse, and, and um, this welfare for the wealthy idea was going to be on steroids. The voucher proliferation was going to go through the roof. It seems that it got shot down. I'm still paying attention, but it seems that it got shot down. So to answer that question, uh, for CPS, those decisions are coming from Columbus. And this is one of those great questions where I can't promise you um, awesome listener and thank you for paying attention to public schools um, I can't promise you that I can end vouchers or charter schools because I'm not running for governor my friend Nan Whaley is and this is my first of numerous plugs that I'm sure will happen in the next half hour to vote for Nan Whaley for governor um, she just won an award for being the education mayor she brought universal preschool to Dayton she's the only candidate for governor talking about universal preschool um, and Nan has my support because she told me to my face over coffee last week that she would fight that, that she would try to end that, because that voucher system is destroying public schools. It's also destroying the schools that they're being used for, and I saw it in my work as assistant principal at Purcell Merriam. I rewrote the budget for the school, I rewrote the financial system for the whole diocese, and I can tell you that when that money comes from the state to a school like Purcell Merriam that actually puts value on accepting kids of different incomes, so it's not just this sort of homogenous looking Catholic school, like a lot of them are. Um, they're punished because when they take the $5,000, there's a built-in eight, actually, nine, 
$7,000 gap of what it takes to educate a kid. So you take 5,000, you don't get the other 7,000, those schools get punished. So the irony, of course, is that folks who say, oh, vouchers are great, school choice, school choice, school choice, they're totally wrong because the vouchers are also hurting the schools that they purport to love so much. Um, so I can tell fight as hard as I can fight and be as loud as I can be uh, to the demagogues in Columbus and the people who have no idea what public education is actually about um, but it's going to take a coalition and it's going to take you and everybody in this room and all the large urban school district boards to actually fight it and even the rural districts because it hurts the rural districts too um, so I'll stop I get excited about because it, it, it's, uh, it's a touchy subject um, for me and it's a uh, it's not helping. Uh, so moving on to our next question, um, what and where is the lowest student to teacher ratio in CPS and uh, what is the highest, what and where is the highest and what will you do to lower the student to teacher ratio in schools where it's too high? I'm going to kind of start at the, the bottom, um, uh, the, the sort of how do you cut the head off of the snake, how do you change the the ratio it's too high you build more schools and that's and you hire more teachers that's the only way um, that I know how to do it Project uh, is building a new school in Fairmount leap that'll be cool they're building Spencer in Walnut Hills we'll see how that goes um, so that's a good start I think I really I think it's a great start and the district should be commended for that I would like to see another magnet dual language um, west side school further west in Westwood or in West Price Hill um, there are a lot of young families out there that are that are aching aching for their own um, school out that way so maybe even a new neighborhood school I think we need to have a serious talk about that but then again hiring more teachers we have to hire more teachers so uh, as far as where the lowest, um, the lowest is probably in a school like Frederick Douglass, which is built for 400 and has about 250 kids in it. Um, I don't know that for a scientific fact, uh, but there are a lot of schools that are severely under-enrolled like Douglass, but then you have schools that are popping like High Park. High Park School, um, which is largely Evanston and Oakley, really. Um, and High Park too, but it's a lot of Evanston and Oakley. It's a fairly diverse school. It's a neat grade school. They're busting it seems. They're renting space from a bank. Um, their LSDMC uh, tried to build a coalition with Evanston Academy and Academy of World Languages and the surrounding schools there, Kilgore, whatever, and build a coalition to go to Cincinnati Public School Board and say, we really want help. Totally ignored. Then there was another neighborhood that threatened litigation and they ended up getting what they wanted. Now, I'm not saying at all that Clifton shouldn't have their own neighborhood school because I think it makes sense. So that's not my, my point. My point is it's that toxic communication strategy that encourages combative behavior. It doesn't encourage collaboration. It encourages, encourages litigation or threats thereof. And then you have people who have been trying to build coalitions, and they see that. And they're like, well, that's how, we're, that's how we're supposed to communicate as opposed to doing what, in my highly biased and professional opinion, I think is the right thing to do is try to bring people together and build a coalition. So um, that's the best answer I have for that. More schools, more teachers. Um, but that also require, <laughs> requires more money. I know it's not that easy. <laughs> and, and so that's why, again, those emergency levy renewals become so important. Uh, so some of us have seen firsthand the damage that an unfair dress code can do to a girl's self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, what we do to ensure gender equal dress codes? Sure. Um, so uh, the only way that I know, and I could be wrong, there could be a million other ideas, and hopefully if I get elected people will give me their million other ideas, but the only way that I know of is to have an actual uniform that is uh, enforced equally, equitably, and fairly. Um, I came from uniform school. Uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my entire life was change the uniform policy of, of Purcell Marion. That might sound silly, uh, but that was really difficult uh, because, again, everyone had very strong opinions. This is how they dress. Um, and we changed it partly for this reason, to be honest, um, and because the dress code didn't make any sense. Um, and so the dress code was redesigned to promote equality, to promote good behavior, um, but to also encourage individualism because you don't want everyone looking like robots. 
So uh, I think having a dress code slash uniform that's actually enforced um, is an important thing to talk about. Teenagers and young kids are going through enough already without worrying about people judging them and how they look. Um, that I, I think, again, that would be part of a discipline policy, but I would need help with it because, again, for me, where I come from in my brain, some kind of uniform seems to be the easiest way to combat it, and I'm sure there are better ideas. Uh, what solution do you propose for dealing with bullying beyond a no tolerance policy? And how should the school board and schools handle situations in which bullying of all kinds, including physical, emotional, and online, occurs? I love that you asked beyond zero tolerance because I imagine everybody would say zero tolerance policy. Um, and if somebody doesn't say zero tolerance policy, they have no business running for this office. Um, and you can quote me on that. There needs to be a process within each school. And so when I talk about a discipline policy, a district-wide discipline policy that can be fairly and equitably implemented and enforced, part of that would be um, contracts. Uh, whether you have a behavior contract with a student that I find to be really successful, but behavior contracts are hollow if you don't make it easy on families to get the services they need. It's the same with community engagement. As a leader, as a governing person, you have to make community engagement easy on the public. It's easy to sit around in your ivory tower and go, people don't vote, people don't engage, blah, blah, blah. People don't vote, people don't engage because you don't give them anything to vote for or engage with because you sit up there and you, and you talk about how people should be voting, but you don't go to them. It's the same way I feel with young people, right, and, and discipline. So you need behavioral intervention. You need maybe therapy, right? More often than not, something is going on. We need to make those sorts of things readily available to the kids. And, and the district does a good job with that now. They do. They absolutely do. I think they do a better job, i.e., here's your contract to remain in this school building because we know that it's better for kids to stay in school than to be suspended. So you have a school like West High where 70 out of 100 kids get suspended and other schools um, like uh, uh, sought after magnets where it's 11 out of 100. Something's wrong. That also speaks to the segregation piece that I talked about at the very beginning. So it's all connected. Um, so you need to have the, whether it's therapy or mental health counseling or whatever in the school and you need to be able to hold the students to account for getting those services. When I had parents come to me and I say, your child needs to seek therapy or all this if they're gonna remain here, and the mom or dad would say, well, I work two jobs, how am I supposed to do that? Or I can't afford it, and they're not lying. They're absolutely right. How can they get their kid to these services? So what did we do? We brought the Ohio Mentor Network to Purcell. And I said, well, good news for you is right next door I've got my friend who can talk to your daughter sign this paper <laughs> but again you had to make it accessible um, so how will you handle sexual harassment or sexual assault issues in schools among students and teachers and how do privacy concerns fit into your approach similar um, there has to be a policy everything needs to have a policy everything needs to be in writing and needs to be enforced it sounds simple, but it's not. Um, Follow-up question, when you talk about the, uh, what, what was it, the privacy um, concerns, what do you mean, can you fill, fill me in more on what you mean by that? Like anonymity of the folks, the people would, themselves are? Yeah, anonymity of the, the, the person involved and also the, probably the child. Absolutely, so um, when you're talking about, if you're talking about um, student to student, um, again, you need to have zero tolerance, but you also need to have a policy that's written and that is enforced and followed. If you're talking about teacher to teacher, um, if you're talking about adults, it's a different story. If you're talking about teacher to teacher, uh, uh, and, if, and if you confirm that this is happening, you fire them, period. Um, if, you're talking about, if you're talking about principal to teacher, you fire them. If we confirm right, that this has absolutely happened, they're gone. With children, again, more often than not, when you talk about young people that are engaged in that kind of behavior, there is something else going on and oftentimes they will need to be removed from the situation. Um, but we need to have early detection process, we need to have a policy in place, and we need to have written procedures that folks follow so it's just not go to the suspension place over at the Jacobs Center. Um, so, and whoever asked that question regarding the anonymity, I, all I can say is I don't fully understand, but if you were talking about the anonymity or the privacy concerns of, of the student, um, you absolutely don't release any of those names um, uh, to the public. Sorry, Biggie K. 
gets upset about these things too. So, uh, how will you handle future challenges to gender-based bathroom issues? Fight them. You know, if 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 uh, if, if uh, uh, people that align themselves with hateful ideologies try to come after our students and their individuality, I'll fight them. My my career shows I'm not afraid to stand up to bigots. I'm not afraid to stand up to hateful people. Um, and if you're if you're going to get in the way of a child's development, I will fight you. And whatever that means, I realize I realize that's a broad, super broad, esoteric thing. But you can Google me; it's true. I will do that. I promise. And we'll do it through policy, and we'll do it through real action. You know, not just ah, picketing, which is also important. We have another question from the audience. Okay. Here. Uh, what low-hanging fruit will you work on fast and early? Fast and early. Get that. My first 100 days, if we're talking in that type of language, we're going to get that communication strategy up and running. We're going to get preschool figured out. Hopefully, it'll be figured out by then. I have some doubts. I think it'll be largely ironed out, but we need to really look at it. Um, and then we also need to get the ball rolling in those first 100 days on a, and revamping the district's um, hiring policy. One last thing for the teachers out there. This is super wonky and super in the weeds. And if you're a teacher, you'll get it. If you're not, you might fall asleep. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. But stop forcing teachers to teach Algebra 1 in eighth grade. We have this failure year built in to our kids' curriculum. Um, Algebra 1, they're doubling up on math in eighth grade. It's something CPS does. The rest of the state doesn't do it. And if you talk to actual educators, like people that really teach, it's terrible. It's super low-hanging fruit. And you get that out of there. The teachers, especially the math teachers in these buildings, the stress level is going to go down. The kids' stress level is going to go down. And eighth grade is a weird enough year. We're, we're talking, that's like Lord of the Flies 24 hours a day, <laughs> right? Uh, eighth grade's tough. Uh, so we need to get that out of there. There's no point. There's no real, uh, uh, I don't know, real learning going on. And that would be a low-hanging thing that we could get rid of, I think. Well, speaking of curriculum, um, Ohio has no model curriculum for sex education, no. which leaves the decisions up to local districts. Um, comprehensive curricula are considered to be the most medically accurate and age-appropriate form of sex education. Um, Absence-only programs have been proven to be ineffective or even harmful. What will you do to ensure our teens get the best sex education public schools can provide? Well, two things. One. Cincinnati Public Schools would have to adopt a sexual education curriculum um, and mandate it district-wide, which doesn't exist. To your point right now, um, sexual education is either taught by a health teacher, it could be one day, it could be a week, it could be a semester, I don't know, but it's just like, eh, who knows? Some are taught by really great involved parents on a PTO, but we don't know, so one parent might go to the conservative Christian church and be teaching abstinence only. Another parent may be going to a super liberal congregation or a group or whoever and they're teaching, they're handing out condoms. I don't know. Um, but the point is we don't know, which is not good. Part two is if there were to be a serious conversation about this, um, I think we need to look at what does sexual education really mean? There's the obvious. But then there's this whole healthy relationships. What are healthy relationships? And, and what does that mean? And what is consent? We need to have a real conversation about consent. And we need yes. to do it twice, sixth grade and 10th grade. They have to do it in sixth grade and 10th grade. So I'm gonna say it one more time to make it three total. If this becomes real and the district really approaches this and I'm on the Public Board of Education, I will do my best to ensure that it's taught twice in sixth grade and in 10th grade. I think that's important and I think that consent piece is largely left out of this and the healthy relationship overarching is largely left out of it. Um, and I, I think those are the most important facets of it. But again, the two, two times, it needs to be taught twice. So um, this is just a question for my own understanding. Um, the, the school board can decide on curriculum or you decide on policy that can affect the curriculum? So we decide on policy that can affect the curriculum. So we wouldn't write the sexual education curriculum. Now we would approve it, right? Um, but implementing the idea that we are going to do this in school year, whatever, that would come from a strategic decision up here with the curriculum department. What does it look like? Then it would largely take another long time to figure out what that means. And honestly, if I were to try to predict the future, 
which I'm not Nostradamus, but if this were to happen, and you you you, you have to invite the community in this conversation, I think it would take it would take some time um, to get to a final a final product and. What it would take is uh, folks that are okay with implementing it and and having people not be happy with them. So um, while it's not an explicit part of my platform, I can tell you and tell everybody that's watching um, that if I'm on the Board of Education and this becomes a real thing, what I would advocate for is community involvement, have it taught twice in sixth and 10th grade, um, but it would need to have a pretty tightly written policy so that every school because right now it's just whatever, and that's not great. So we have about 10 minutes left. If you're sitting on a question in the audience, make sure you get it in in the next few minutes so we can ask Mike. Um, we have another question for the audience here right now. Um, at one time, CPS featured decentralized decision making, which included greater autonomy and authority for LSDMCs and local school budgeting. Um, today it is largely centralized. Uh, what educational decisions on CPS should be centralized? And what decisions should be entrusted to local schools? That's a great question. Um, I mean, the the budget at the end of the day and the budget's approval, I feel, should be centralized. Um, the way dollars are allocated in schools, I think, uh, can be left up to the, the good people that run those schools. For example, not every school is going to have the same budgetary needs. Um, and I think we need to have a serious discussion about that. And so while we as the central governing body, if I am to be elected, would set the strategic direction, we would set the budget, and we'd say, here are the dollars that go to these schools. The way those dollars are then allocated, I think the LSDMCs could have more autonomy. And I don't know um, if this referring to, uh, there was a time when the facilities master plan happened, and I'm certain the person who asked this is familiar with that, because this is a really insightful question. That was a time when it seemed like the district really reached out to everybody to say, what should the district look like going forward? Um, there was a really good seed planted there of community engagement that just sort of got uh, gasoline poured on it instead of water. I was trying to come up with an analogy. That's the best I had. So at that time, the schools were more empowered. Um, but back to what I was talking about with the individual schools. So a school like Gamble Montessori has different budgetary needs than a school like Fairview, than a school like Rothenburg, than a school like Rockdale, than a school like SCPA. Um, you, you have um, schools that are interested in experiential learning that are afraid to ask the district for more money because if they do, they're afraid that they're just going to be told you don't get anything. So I, I don't want to get too far away from the heart of the question here, um, but I feel like that piece in schools having different budgetary needs is important and needs to be taken into account at the district central level, right? Um, so that the central level can better allocate out here to empower those schools to make the decisions. Because right now, the central governing body is treating everyone equally, which is, as we know, not always equitably. And as a result, then, everyone's hands are sort of tied from the starting gate. Um, so I think we need to look, before we get to this, what precludes that is what do these different schools need if we're going to brag about having two Montessori high schools and the SCPA and the PRM. If we're going to brag about that stuff, we need to empower those schools to do what we're bragging about, and right now we're not. If we do that, then I think we can give them more autonomy to say, all right, now you work your magic. You do what you got to do, because at SCPA, you hear them tell this story. That's not how it is right now. Um, so the budget... But then again, the hiring the principals, LSDMCs do that, but LSDMCs, and then I'll stop. Um, LSDMCs, as I referenced before, don't have any real fiscal or financial um, power. So I would like to talk more about that, but to do that, we need to know what the schools need. And to do that, we need a communication strategy and people on the board that actually listen. So what can we do locally to help Cincinnati Public Schools and ensure that we teach all and that funding is distributed equitably, sure. as you mentioned. Um, I would encourage folks to go mentor in any of the schools that have programs. Euler, Rothenberg, come to mind. Um, I would um, go take a tour of a school, reach out to a teacher buddy and ask them, can I come see your school? They'd be happy to show you around. I would dispel the myth uh, that CPS is this failing, terrible district. I, I think if you were to talk to most of the parents in CPS, they would tell you that's patently false. Um, and I would, I would encourage um, people to look at their neighborhood school. Uh, I think that may be the, the most pressing need right now, and I think if we all come together as a community 
and we all look at our neighborhood schools together and and I've encouraged family friends of mine um, who will say things this might sound familiar to some of you well I love where I live now but I can't send my I can't send my kid to the school I'm not arrogant enough to tell people where to send their kids to school that's not who I am I am gutsy enough to push back on friends of mine and say, well, what if, what if you and so-and-so and so-and-so and our other friends, what if you all went together, right? You all have kids around. So what if everybody went in there together or got a hold of the principal and said, hey, what, can we go out afterwards and after school grab a drink or grab coffee before school? I want to talk to you about what your school is like. That's the only way it's going to happen. And one more thing on that, um, back to the reintegration slash desegregation bit. Um, I understand that that's difficult. I do. And, but what I would like to remind um, people is that we've been asking um, African Americans to forcefully integrate themselves for decades. And we've created a system and a situation where schools are segregated again. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to just admit that. Um, is it good? Is it bad? Again, I'm not the judgment police, um, but I do like reality. I live in reality. I see it every day with the homeless families with whom I work. Reality is tough, and we live in a segregated city, and we need to admit that, and we need to realize we're in this together, and we need to talk to each other and go to school together. Because if we don't go to school together, we're never going to play together, and we're never going to work together, and this idea of mixed income neighborhood isn't going to happen. Well said. Thanks. Uh, this will be the final question for today. Um, what kinds of job training are being offered by CPS and what kinds of training should be offered? And over time, how will CPS assess what job training needs to be addressed? So, awesome question. And so you referenced that I'm on the, one of the state's workforce investment boards, um, which is fine, but my subcommittee um, is really where I feel like I get a lot done. And my subcommittee that I'm on, I'm one of three representatives from the state. Um, myself, a man named Chris, who works with all the apprenticeships and the unions in town. Um, Sherry, um, our executive director. Um, we, we are the state's representatives, but on this board, Emerging Workforce, our sole job is to determine what that, that question, for 16 to 24 year olds in Hamilton County. So obviously CPS is at the table, charter schools are at the table, everybody's at the table, all kinds of people are at the table, uh, urban leagues at the table, community action agencies at the table. Our job is to determine where are those opportunities? We have employers at the table that help us determine it. Um, so we're doing that now. Uh, if I'm elected to the public school board, I would be the de facto public school board representative on the state board. Um, I would also like to take this time, not that anybody maybe was wondering, but you listed off a lot of things that I do and I've been telling people on the campaign trail, if I'm elected, I'm resigning from all of those things uh, because I want to focus fully on the public school board. I would probably retain my role though on emerging workforce because I would be the public school representative. Um, and there's presently none of the school board members go to these meetings. So it's already happening, and there's a lot of money for it, and the CPS representatives are the, the GED um, folks down uh, over by Taft High School. They're awesome folks, by the way. And they're there. It makes sense. They're working with a lot of folks who are older, so they're trying to help them pipe them into workforce opportunities. But nobody from the Board of Education goes to the meetings. Nobody. So without boring you about what we're talking about at that board, on that board, um, we're looking at that now. In the schools, you asked the question about what exists now. Um, there's not a ton. Uh, the state has talked about allowing sort of workforce development opportunities to count toward graduation, which I think is really great. Um, not everybody is going to go to college, nor should everybody. Um, and so I think we need to talk and look at more what can we do locally to increase our workforce opportunities. So we have Great Oaks. Um, in the Oaks program, which is nice, but it's pretty, uh, it's prohibitive because of transportation. It's pretty far away. Um, so I think we need to talk to the employers, look at what's going on locally, keep Job Corps in the loop, and all of these people that are already working with young folks and see how CPS can be better partners. Um, CPS is notoriously not easy to work with, and so sometimes the conversation ends before it starts. And while uh, I, I think there's been some good intentions um, in, in different schools, I won't name them by name, I, I, I don't know if the intention and the, the work for actually panned out. Um, 
we talked a lot about technology that didn't seem to pan out in some of the schools. So I think we need to have real discussions about what employers really want um, because I think the business community in this town, um, and not every urban district can say this, um, by and large, uh, the business community in this town wants to see schools succeed. And, and what that looks like, I think the Board of Education can help steer and should steer that conversation because they're piped in to the people that do the work every day. Well, as um, I touched on at the beginning of this interview and Mike has touched on throughout, he has a lot of experiences, a lot of current experiences, a lot of past experiences, a lot of um, things he's been awarded for that um, are that he's awarded for his experiences that he's had a um, very diverse range of things that will help him on the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to know more, um, feel free to visit his, his website at mikemoroski.com. It's M-I-K-E-M-O-R-O-S-K-I.com. Um, he also has a Twitter account at Mike underscore Moroski. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, those are the places to go. Um, Mike, do you have anything that you'd like to wrap up with? I would just like to encourage everybody that's watching to um, make sure all their friends get out and vote. I would like to thank uh, Together We Will uh, for coming to our home tonight uh, for this interview. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I really, really do appreciate what you all are doing. Again, I think uh, I was talking with some folks before we started tonight that um, you know this whole process, this political process, getting to know your candidates, uh, I think is kind of intimidating for folks. And making access easy to people like y'all are doing, I think is a really big deal. Um, I just want to piggyback off of what you said. I am uh, very accessible. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, reach out to me. Um, my personal email is mikemoroski at gmail.com. Um, so Mike, M-O-R-O-S-K-I at gmail.com. Shoot me a question. Uh, I'd be happy to engage with you. I uh, will warn you that my organization is running two summer camps right now for kids experiencing homelessness. And when I'm not doing that, I'm knocking on doors or talking to my friend Tara or other good people like you. So it may not be tomorrow, um, but everybody that was asking these questions, clearly the folks that are watching this are paying attention and understand the district. So I'm going to tell you one last thing and then I'll shut my mouth. Yes, shoot me your questions, but what I need and want even more than that is your ideas. And uh, anybody who knows me knows that that is not a hollow ask. I want your ideas. I need your ideas. Uh, I won't always be able to follow up on your ideas, but the only way I'll be able to do my job well if I'm elected is to have you be engaged. The only way that I can be held accountable is if you're engaged and can hold me to account. So the door is open. I hope to see you on the campaign trail, and thanks so much. Thank you, Mike, for being here. And again, thank you to Don from Cincinnati State for our interview. Yeah, let's hear it for Don, huh? Yeah.